Does anybody have any good news while we're sitting here waiting for tech to get it together? Good news. <laughs> President Sweeney, it's yes. we're ready to go live. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your patience. Now? Yes, you, you can start now. Good evening. Welcome to York City School District Committee meeting, October the 12th, 2020. We'll begin with our athletic committee. Mr. Director Breland. Athletics, um, this is um, Vice President Brian. That's all right, that's quite all right. We knew, we knew what you meant. <laughs> I told you some mic on first. All committee members are uh, present today and items for discussion, spectator plans for indoor and outdoor events. I believe that uh, Mrs. Thomas is giving that report. Ms. Thomas, are you here? Yes, I am here, but Dr. Fitch is gonna do the whole thing this evening. I'm here for support. All right, thank you. Dr. You're Fitch. Welcome. Good evening, President Sweeney, Chairperson Bryant, and may it please the school board. I'm here to present the athletic information and answer all questions. But before we start, I wanna recognize the 31st anniversary of the passing of Louis Atwater III on October 5th, 1989. He was a true representation of a student athlete. Mr. Atwater gave his all on and off the field. This is a testament to his family, and I believe the pride that he showed as a Bearcat. Let us take a brief moment of pause for Mr. Lewis Atwater. Thank you. I would like to give an update on our spectator plan continuing with the governor's guidance. The school district of the city of York will allow spectators for the home team only. Spectators will be sitting on both the home and visitor sides of the stadium. Any spectator coming into the stadium will have their temperature checked with a no touch thermometer and there will be no concession stands, no movement unless using the restrooms. We will be utilizing social distancing and masks will be worn at all times. Also, you will be able to bring water into small field. In adhering to the guidelines, we have to account for the participants, including the following, players and coaches from both teams, game officials, game announcers, the media, emergency medical staff, the trainers, the school district of the city of York athletic department staff, security, band, cheerleaders, and custodial staff, along with the film crews from both teams, totaling 243 in the stadium. The stadium capacity with the governor's 25% stipulation is 563 persons. When you subtract the total number of participants, 243, from the 25% capacity of 563, you end up with 320 possible seats for spectators. The decision was to offer each student participant three tickets, football, band, and cheerleaders, equaling a total of 315 tickets. Students receive tickets on Thursdays at the end of practice at the football field. Students will then have to sign for their tickets at the field. Our winter sports update, we, will, we have concluded our winter sports interviews and Mr. Bernhardt will share the results of the interview. Fall sports update. I would like to give an update on the events that have been happening during the fall sports season. I want to thank our incredible coaches for the fall season who had to endure a pandemic, limited spectators, all while trying to teach students the skills and practice needed to play a fall sport. They have been working hard to have student athletes ready to participate. And I cannot tell you how proud I am of the work that they have done and accomplished during strained times. In cheerleading, Coach Aaron Grayson, Casey Werner, and T. Martin have done a wonderful job having students ready and prepared to cheer. The girls have been committed all season long and have even worked to help other sports like girls soccer when a few players of the soccer team were injured. The girls, showed resiliency and continued to cheer through the heat, wind, and cold. We are so proud of the coaches and these young women. 
in marching band with Mr. Kevin Cromer, Laura Aza, and Zach Clayhorn as the leaders. The band performed and worked tirelessly during the summer in preparation for the season. The band went through the long days and nights of band camp and worked to perform before home varsity games. They showed the effort and perseverance that will propel them on to great things in life. We appreciate the work that they have shown to our athletic program with class and dignity. Our girls soccer team was led this year by coach Jessica Derrickson and Erica Bear. They worked hard to have our team learn the game and complete against many teams who have players that had multiple years of playing soccer. Our team would never quit. And even though they were still learning the game, their sportsmanship and competitive nature was evident and recognized by a Southwestern parent who chooses to be renameless and had her company donate $500 to our program only due to our girls' positive attitude and spirit shown on the field. In girls volleyball with coach Denise Brown and Imani Perkis, the team showed dedication and drive this year. The issue of having no fans in the stands did not hinder the team's output as they passed, set, and hit against veteran teams with seasoned players. They worked hard to show that they belonged on the excuse, floor. Excuse me a minute, please. I don't know if we're, we're, uh, what we're doing right now is legal. It's not on YouTube. There's nothing. The public cannot hear us right now. President Sweeney, it is on YouTube and it is running. It's just the link that's actually out there. It needs to be updated. And Mike has sent that to Shay and Shay is working on updating that. So they need to click, click the new link to get to it. Okay. But I, I can watch it running and I can see it because I have a screen up with the YouTube one. It is running. It's just the link has changed. Okay. So we're, we're taking care of it while you're talking. It's just something I, 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 Okay, I apologize. That's fine, President Sweeney. Thank you, though, for uh, letting us uh, talk that out. All right. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, Dr. Fitz, because we have to be in the public's eyes is the reason that I had stopped you, just so you know. I have okay. no problem. Okay, I apologize. Go ahead. That is no problem. Mm -hmm. Our students continue to work hard and show that they belonged on the floor and they gained respect from their opponents. Even though the score sometimes don't work in their favor, it really didn't matter because our women left it all on the floor and showed it is their reason to belong in that competition. Coach Christopher Jones and Jeff Werner led our boys soccer team for the 2020 and 2021 season. The young men demonstrated passion and power as they ran up and down the field, kicking, trapping, and scoring on opponents. The record does not demonstrate the energy and effort that they put on display. They work together as a unit and continue to get better and better as the year progressed. They had a fire that they brought to each game and caught the eyes of many of the coaches who would say nothing but positive things to me via emails. Again, they left it all on the field. In football, Coach Russ Stoner, Andy Stauffer, Will Clark, Ben Crager, and Matt Baker, they continued to build upon a strong foundation and develop a program that many are coming to view in high regard throughout the state. There have been multiple players for Athlete of the Week numerous times. They've received a donation of $1,000 to the AFL program and had coaches from Millersville and Shippensburg Universities, along with a representative from the National Preps Recruiting Service visit and inquire about our players. The players have demonstrated the dedication, desire, and determination that would make our community proud. And also, if you witnessed the game against Red Lion, you saw on display the fortitude needed to make it in life. They really would have made Lewis Atwater proud. This year has been trying and difficult at times, but I want to publicly thank the coaches, the community, and the administration for your patience and the board in supporting and working with me to help students have an opportunity to participate in fall sports and do it in a safe manner. On Saturday, October 24th at 7 p.m. at Smalls Field, we will recognize all of our fall senior student athletes with a brief ceremony. This will also be live streamed on the district's YouTube channel. This concludes my report and I will answer any questions. Dr. Fitch, this is Director Kennedy. I just have a question around the um, spectator plan for indoor and outdoor events. 
um, have there been or are there any guidelines that are provided um, as well as um, what a outcome would be for those spectators who do not comply with um, COVID uh, mitigating factors when participating at events and who's going to monitor um, folks, the spectators? We have our school police department and we've been working with them. We developed this plan. Um, I wanna thank uh, Commissioner Maldrow and uh, Lieutenant Johnson, as well as uh, Ms. Thomas for helping us with this, develop the plan for our outdoor spectators. We are still in the process of working for our indoor numbers due to the fact that the only indoor sport currently will be volleyball. And with the numbers that we have, we are showing that we will not meet the maximum to uh, have an issue concerning having tickets. So that's why with volleyball, we will not have that. Um, we will have a significant plan for our outdoor sports. Any uh, persons that do not comply, um, we will just remind them to comply. And also they will be ticket holders that the students will give. So we truly believe that the community will adhere to our recommendations only because there's a limited number of tickets and they are there to see their students. And I believe that we will not have any issues because I believe that our community and our parents really and our families have been wanting to see our student athletes. So I am truly believing in our community and in our spectators and in our families that they will comply. I have a question. Yes, you ma'am. 320, I believe that you said, uh, tickets and you're utilizing how many? We have 320 possible seats um, with our, we will be utilizing 315 giving to um, the football players, the band members, and the cheerleaders. Okay, I didn't hear you mention any school board members. No, I did not. I have a question. There's five seats left. Five so if seats school, left. So school board members want to go, there's enough for five of them to go. I have a question. Yes, sir. Dr. Fitch. In my conversation with the superintendent, I thought we were offering tickets to varsity participants of the team. You weren't, in, you weren't included in that meeting. That was a meeting I had with Dr. Barry. That is that that is he is talking about varsity. So the JV players that are on the field will not receive tickets for that game. They'll receive them for the JV game. So everybody, every team member will get tickets, but for their respective game. OK, so when you have varsity football, if they're not a varsity player. I'm trying to understand the numbers. Maybe I'm, I'm confused somewhere. George, don't some, don't 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 some of the JV players suit up for the varsity game? Yes, yes they that, do, Doctor Barry. Okay. So yeah. we, if if you're if if you're on the field, you're counted towards capacity. So that's why they have to be counted. They're not getting tickets for their parents, but they still have to be counted toward capacity. That wasn't the question. I was talking about the varsity players. Well, yeah, they're all getting tickets. Everybody's getting three, all the varsity players, the band and the cheerleaders are all getting three tickets each. How many? So everybody, everybody suited up is getting three tickets. No, not everybody that's suited up is getting three tickets. The varsity football players, the cheerleaders, the, and the band are all the varsity. The senior cheerleaders are whole cheerleading squad because they're considered varsity. Okay. The, every, those people are getting three tickets each. Okay. Okay. How many of each, please? The numbers that we had were 61 football. No. There's 61 okay. football players? 61. That's varsity and JV, 61 football players? Yes, ma'am. That's football players, not the, not the, the and right. we're, not, we're not talking about the, the mascots or nothing like that, right? That's correct. 
How many cheerleaders? Cheerleaders, we had 13. Okay, keep going. And band, it was 31. That's all? Wow. Yeah. Okay, keep going. I want to know. Keep going. There's more. You got your medics. Oh, Two. You want me to, okay, hold yeah, on. I want 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 to break break yeah, I want the breakdown. Yeah, I want the breakdown. That's what we were trying to figure okay, out. Okay, all right. I, I didn't know you want the, the number breakdown. I thought you just wanted with this with the spectators. Okay, hold on. Let me get that for you. Apologize about that. No, this I, is I, Mr. Breland. I thought that's what we were getting when you started spouting the numbers off at the beginning. The okay. number of players, the number of staff from both teams and the respective teams and their numbers. I thought that was a breakdown. Okay. We gave you totals. Right. I gave you the totals. I didn't know you needed the actual breakdown. Give me a yes. minute, please. Okay. Jessica, while he's doing that, can you help me, please? I can't get this on YouTube. I can um, on my phone. Sure, I will text you over the link. Give me one second. Right, yeah, but no, I'm looking at it on the TV, and it has 25 people waiting. And when I go anywhere else, I can't get on. So there's other people that can't get on as well. There was 45 people waiting. But I do have the link that you already sent me. That you and that if I touch they that, put, that they put the link out on Facebook, they put it out on the website, and they put it out on yeah, but the link what happened was the link wasn't working. No, they put the new link out on Facebook and the, the new app? link out on YouTube. I mean on the um YouTube and the um website. All three. You, at, you, the, you, at the top of the website, there's an emergency bar. And where the emergency bar is, that's where the link is. You ready? Yeah, you ready? Okay. Um, for our home team, we will have 85 total count. 61 of those will be varsity players. Wait a minute. Hold up. You're telling me we got 61 varsity football players? Varsity and JV football players. Yes, ma'am. During no. the last game, there had a lot of players because okay, just because you played JV. No, wait a minute. No, I don't. I don't. The JV are not getting tickets. Varsity, just varsity is getting tickets. So how many varsity players do we have? Okay. When you define varsity, are you talking about people that are in 11th and 12th grade? I'm talking about play anybody the that or? plays varsity football. Okay. They could be a freshman, but if they play varsity football, they're varsity. How many players do we have on the varsity squad? I already told you 61. 61, ma'am. Okay, well, where did the 80 where did the 80 something time come okay, from? 85 was included in the count with the coaches and support staff that happens for our team. Dr. Fitch, can I interrupt for a second? How many President, Sweeney, President Sweeney, are you asking for ticket numbers for students or total numbers of people broken down by category on the field? I, would, I want a total number of people broken down on the field. Okay, so that's what he's giving you. So for York City School District, between the student players and all of our staff, it's 85 people. Okay, that's not what I want. I want to know how many varsity football players, how many JV football players, how many varsity cheerleaders, how many water boys do we have or whatever they call them nowadays? How many coaches? Okay, that's what he gave you. He gave you 61 for football. He gave me 61 football players. That's varsity. Or JV. That's everybody who's going to participate in the game. So that's varsity then. 
JV's on the field, but they don't participate in the game. President Sweeney, at, and, and this is up to Coach Stoner, because the one game that we were winning, he put the JV fresh, he put the JV team in because we were beating other teams so bad. So he allows them to participate in a varsity game. So that's why they count as the number. That's what I was going off of. Okay, so we have 61 players that's going to get three tickets. Yes, ma'am. So that's JV players are getting tickets as well. Yes, ma'am, because they could play varsity. But realistically, out of those 61 people, not all 61 of them are getting onto the field. So, Director Breland, you're correct, but we have no we have no control over that. So, to be fair and to be right, we, we have to honor them since we don't know who Coach Stoner is going to put in or not put in. We have to honor them by giving them tickets. It wouldn't be right. So, this is JV and varsity players are getting these tickets. If they're going to be on that field Friday night, they're getting tickets. Okay, so we got 61 players. Varsity and JV, cheerleaders is 13, bands 31. How many coaches do we have? We have roughly 15 coaches. No, how many? Not roughly, how many? We need to know that number. That are on payroll. That are on payroll. One, two, three, four, five. Five that are on payroll. You have other people on the field. Yes, we have volunteer coaches. Okay, we need to know those numbers. How many are volunteer coaches? You have 10 volunteer coaches that also help out with the, the balls, <laughs> that help out with the water, because I did not know you needed an actual breakdown or I would have had their names. I don't Didn't need the names, all I need is the numbers. Okay. So and I don't need to know what they do, I just need to know if they're gonna be on the field, there's 10. Are they getting tickets? No, ma'am, because they're adults. Nope, just checking. So none of the coaches are getting tickets? No. No, ma'am. OK. OK, and how many other, what else we have out there? We have the paramedics. That's yes, ma'am, that, that's four? five. We have two um, EMTs, two doctors, and one um, uh, associate trainer. Uh, is that associate trainer? Is that her, um, uh, what's her name? Well, I can't no, the word. we have our own trainer, but this is one trainer. that they're partic that is participating and helping out with the emergency medical staff. Okay, and then, so then we have our trainer, Correct. Okay, and then we have the cheerleading coach. Yes, ma'am. There are three of them. And we have the band director. Yes, ma'am. There's three of them. Who else are we missing? Security? How many security are we having? S security. There are eight SPOs. And only people getting tickets is the football players and the cheerleaders and the band. Yes, ma'am. Did I miss anybody? We have maintenance. How many maintenance men do we have down there? Last time we had four, so we're anticipating four again. With people being there? I'm sorry? With people being on the field, you're going to only have four? So yes, ma'am. So it's to the bathroom, is someone cleaning up behind them or no? We had four maintenance personnel and they did an excellent job when, like I said, when we were there, that their roles and what they have to do, I would have to speak to their supervisor so we can dictate what they would do. Cause I'm not going to speak on it now because this is our first time having spectators. So correct. That's could, what I'm saying. Right. So two could possibly be manning the, the, the restroom. Yes, ma'am. But I, I don't, I can't tell you exactly right now. That's all the that's all the all the people on the field. 
from your no, ma'am. School district. No, Who ma'am. Else? We also have um, my the uh, administration, along with the uh, personnel from the athletic department. The athletic department. Yes, <laughs> myself and my secretary, along with the announcers um, and timekeeper and spotter. You got That's one timekeeper, one announcer. And one spotter, along with the high school representation as administration. How many are they? Two. So it's a total of seven. If you add it all together. What? No, I've, I've got them individually. Okay. So that's two from your car. Mm -hmm. Okay, who else? Next, we have nine officials and chain gang. Five officials and three chain gang, along with one spotter as well. So we have two spotters then. We have two spotters then. No, one spotter, one spotter is on the field and he's working with the chain gang. You have another person that is up in the booth. The one is ours, the other one is normally with the officials. So that's two spotters. One's on the field and one's in the booth. Correct? Correct? I don't see it that way, but if that's how you have to hear it, yes, correct. How many people was it? Two people, right? One Both spotter spotters. for us, we get one spotting and so that they know where the ball is. The other one's on the field with the referees. Okay, it's two spotters, okay. Who else? Then they're averaging between 60 players and coaches coming from the other team. They're not bringing anybody with them? Band, cheerleaders? No, ma'am. They're bringing, though, their film crew. And roughly, we try to get that information the week before. Today is Monday. Southwestern hasn't submitted that information, but we try to rough it and get an estimate off of our last count. OK. I did write it down, but could you give me a breakdown and I'll come and get it tomorrow? As soon as uh, the Southwestern Athletic Director gives it to me, I will do I, that. I don't need Southwestern. I need just ours. Everything but Southwest. When we look at the total number of how we got to 243, we're including that Southwestern count. Uh, Dr. Fitz, could you please write, give me a copy of everything you just told me and I'll come and get it tomorrow? Yes, ma'am. You already have it. And you do not have to have Southwest. I can, I can add 60 on the Southwest for Southwest. Okay. And, the, and you have, you said you have five tickets for board members? There are five tickets if, that are available. Go ahead, Mr. Breland. Thank you, Dr. Fitch, for that. Yeah, this is Carmen's. This is Carmen's. Yes, that's all right. That's all right. No, no, no. I was, I was telling you to go ahead because you were shaking your head, like saying. Oh, I was no. just, I was, I'm just, I'm just listening to the dialogue. I have okay. other questions, but I'll, I'll hold them for now. Okay. Thank you, um, Dr. Fitch, for that great update, and I'm, I'm glad to see that everything is working out so well for the school district, um, especially during the, um the conditions that we are enduring right now. So I appreciate that and all that you're doing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other remarks? Michael, you wanna say something now? Mr. No, I'm, not, I'm gonna hold my remarks. Thank okay, you. yep. Superintendent remarks? I have none. Madam President, that concludes the athletic committee meeting agenda. Thank you, Director Bryan. Next, we'll have buildings and ground. 
Director Liggins, are you ready? Yes, I am. Okay, good evening, um, Madam President, Board Directors, and all listening. Looks like all board members are present, uh, except for the absence of Director Tanya Thompson Morgan. And uh, there were several items for discussion that were sent out to the board directors. So hopefully everyone had a chance to look at um, each item. There are no new updates um, outside of uh, the buildings and grounds flow chart that was added to this week's items for discussion. And did any board directors have any questions in reference to any of those items for discussion? Travel expenses. I don't need to oh, talk about them too much. Oh, excuse me. Um, any other remarks? I, I have a question. Uh, yeah. Is Mr. Differentoff, is he on the board? I mean, is he on the. Um... I am. Yes, um, I asked you for an organizational chart. Yes. Um, you gave me a list of who worked where. Organizational chart, I wanted to know who reports to whom. That is, uh, that, that is the, well, it's called a flow chart on the agenda, but it is an organizational chart. This is not what I'm looking at. You cannot tell who works from, you don't, you don't know who's responsible for whom. Like who's who's supervisor? Uh, we can go back and revisit it, and I'll send it over. We kind of need it. I kind of needed that for the night for part of our discussion and personnel. Okay, I mean we can talk through it if you'd like. Okay. Well, we have to do it during personnel. Okay. Okay. Um, any remarks from the superintendent? No, ma'am. If no other board members have any questions or remarks, that concludes my report, Madam President. Thank you, Director Liggins. You're welcome. Next on the agenda is cafeteria agenda. Director Orr, are you there? Director Orr? She can't hear me? I can see her. Can you hear me? Yeah. Are you okay now? Okay now. Okay. I'm still seeing, and there's a, I don't know what's going on with this. There's a, a echo. There's an echo. I don't know why. Okay. Okay. Yep. Still uh, echo. Director Orr, do you have more than one device running the Zoom meeting? Mm-hmm. I still think it's on TV. <laughs> Director, are you still have yourself muted?
We should be good now. Okay, can everyone hear me now? That's perfect. Yes. I'm still seeing Tanya Thompson Morgan as chairperson. Correct. That is that. my mistake and I will correct it. Oh my goodness, this has been going on now for the last several months. Anyway, getting to items for discussion is Mr. Mark Macy uh, on our meeting, in our meeting? Yes, I am. Okay, can you give us an update, please? Yes, ma'am. The following is the report um, for the month of September 2020 for the Food Service Department. Um, for the month, we served an average of 81 students per day in each location or 28,300 meals for the month. Growth in meals re remains slow, but we continue to work closely with Shaquana Mitchell and the principals to get the word out with robocalls and through online teacher interaction with students. Um, we are also anticipating approval from PDE this week to begin weekend meals for students uh, starting on Friday. Um, meals for both Saturday and Sunday will be provided for students that wish to pick up or take home meals with them uh, after, after uh, class on Friday. Uh, in addition to meal growth, we remain focused on improving efficiencies and savings for the district. Government commodities continue to be a major part of the menu and our kitchen teams are finding creative ways to use up excess inventory to help lower costs. For example, um, we've got a couple of schools that are making flatbed pizza with some flatbed we had left over from a promotion. Um, we're working uh, with uh, Vendetta Banks at the high school She's coming up with a recipe to use up some of our unbreaded chicken tenders uh, for some chicken corn soup. And uh, we've got leftover breakfast items in the high school. Well, not leftover, but frozen breakfast items in the high school that we won't be using anytime soon. And we're coming up with a menu uh, next Tuesday for breakfast for lunch. So we're trying to find ways to use this food up and again, continue to use what we've got internally to control our costs. Current on-hand commodities total $69,755. Uh, the staffing adjustment that we made last month to 5.5 hours for 300 employees is running very smoothly. And it's really allowed us to continue meeting service expectations, again, while reducing the overall labor cost. Um, last week, Monday, the after-school program began in all the K-8 buildings. Um, Right now we're providing after school uh, meals for them on both Mondays and Tuesdays in all of the schools except for Hannah Penn. Hannah Penn is Wednesday only. We're providing reheatable. Uh, these are already, they're already cooked and cooled down. They're either reheatable meals or bag dinners to students that are signed up for a scheduled tutoring session uh, on their scheduled night. And then lastly, starting tomorrow, the 13th, um, the fresh fruit and vegetable program begins in all K-8 buildings we'll be providing a fruit or vegetable um, in addition to lunch as an additional item for all students picking up a meal at, at one of the schools. And that's my report. Thank you. Um, I was, I'm very impressed with the idea that you're gonna be sending meals home with the children on the weekends. Uh, actually, who came up with that idea or is it that we're trying to uh, get rid of all the food during the week, leftovers from the week? Um, basically what happened was the, the state came out and said that they would allow us to extend what they call the seamless, seamless summer option uh, program into the, the fall. Um, and through that program, um, they are allowing us to, um, to, com to allow weekend meals as well. So we've got to add the other four locations. That's what we're in the process of doing right now. The schools that weren't part of the summer program. Uh, but then, yeah, starting on Friday, and again, we anticipate it getting back the approval this week, we'll be able to have those meals. And no, those won't be leftovers. We're actually doing uh, bag breakfast and bag lunches, but it's not going to be leftovers from the week. We're going to be providing meals just for those two days for everybody. Okay, so now, though, does that mean locations will have to be open on weekends? And who's going to man those locations? No, ma'am. Um, on Friday, when we are open from 11 to 1, when students come to pick up their lunch for Friday and their breakfast for Saturday, we're going to give them a lunch for Saturday and a breakfast for Sunday and a lunch for Sunday and a breakfast for Monday. We're going to give them three sets of meals instead of. Just okay. So this will all occur on Fridays. That's correct. Oh, okay. Okay. Very good. 
Well, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Any other comments from the board? Yes, um, President Sweeney. Uh, I have a question. Is that going to inter um, interfere with our five hours? 5.5 hours, because you're now talking to my, about making four more meals on Friday. Well, actually, we're going to start prepping for them on Wednesday. There's a lot of things that we can do on Wednesday. We can pre-bag the carrots. We can, um, you know, we can thaw out the fruit cups. We can thaw out the juice. There's a lot of pre pre-staging things that we can do on Wednesday that'll get us ready for the weekend. But we'll, we'll monitor it closely on Friday. If we run into a problem, we'll have to go back and address it and figure out what we need to do to make it work for everybody. Okay, but you're not gonna come back and ask for more hours because you added more sandwiches. That's correct. Okay. Anyone else? Superintendent? No, ma'am, I have nothing, thank you. That concludes my report, Madam President. Thank you. Next we have uh, education, Director Breland. Thank you, Madam President. All board members being present for this committee. At this time, we have a superintendent's presentation. Thank you, Ms. Althoff. So um, today we are going to give you your learning safely update um, involving next steps for um, the school district of, city, of the city of York in the pandemic. Jess, thank you. So the first, the first slide um, is the transmission table put from the state. As I told you last time we spoke, this transmission table was put out weekly. So we are just updating it as we get information. So as you can see, we're holding steady at moderate. And if you look at the um, translation of the table at up top for moderate, it says that you can do blended, le blended learning model or full remote model. So um, as you can see, we are right now still doing full remote model. Um, and as the numbers are climbing, I'm assuming they're not climbing enough that they are moving us out of the moderate stage there. They have not moved to substantial and we are hopeful that they do not. Okay, Ms. Alto. So um, the decision data points when we talk about next steps for the district are listed before you. Um, we get a lot of input from the different entities that you see, um, being able to return um, more employees is something that is not listed there, but is also something that we are um, considering um, in our future. So basically when we are looking at what to do next or what recommendation to make, it is based on these data points. Once again, we put out another survey and I was pretty proud that this survey rendered back a 2100 um, student turnaround and we got 2100 surveys back within the span of, I believe it was three days. So the last time in order to get half of the, the staff, we were truly um, doing a lot. So a lot of folks picked up on the survey. And what was really nice is there were a lot of folks forwarding the survey on Facebook to friends saying, please fill out this survey for school, please fill out this survey for school. So basically what the survey 
off of the 2,100 folks that filled it out is telling us is that 37.3% um, um, are, comf are most comfortable with their Bearcat cyber status or, or, or Bearcat cyber status. And the other 62.7% is comfortable with the idea of hybrid learning meaning um, students returning in the fashion of an A day, B day, um, with 50% of the population attending each time, two days a week. We have some family perspectives before you here. Um, they're not all good. Um, some of them are um, for a hybrid model, others are against. Um, I'm, I'm most proud to be able to highlight that our families are speaking the truth and being able to be a part of the decision matrix. Generally, we have difficulty getting families to fill out the surveys and be a part of the decision making, but um, they really stepped up this time and um, for that I'm pretty proud. Next slide. We also surveyed some staff. Um, we surveyed 560 total staff that's who filled out the staff survey. And um, basically, as you can see from the chart, it's all over the map. So 44.3% is saying that they're not comfortable returning to hybrid and um, a total of about 55% has illustrated some level of comfort, whether it's somewhat comfortable or comfort, comfortable um, with no concerns. We have some teacher comments as well. Again, both for and against, um, but speaking their truth professionally and being partners in the process. Um, these decisions are not easy and um, the recommendations are not easy because there's a lot at stake for all stakeholders. Our ultimate goal being what's in the best interest for our children. And so um, these are some of the comments that the teachers and staff are, have made. As you can see, this slide should not be um, foreign to you as it is the slide that we were showing when we were building out the various phases. And the goal was always to eventually move from the remote stage to the hybrid stage or to full reopening. And the goal in the beginning was to be able to be able to bounce between one or the other. I'm very proud of this, the executive staff because from the very beginning, they've been building out three plans at once. So they've been building out all three areas all along. So the bulk of the work for each one is done. There's some refining that needs to be done within each of them, but we have the, the, um, the shell for what we want to do if, if we go hybrid pretty much together. So um, the hybrid model is illustrated in the middle and yellow on this slide and it speaks from the perfect the um the perspective the perspective of the transmission table so in the transmission table it said that you could be either hybrid or virtual and so we are looking at okay we've been virtual now for several weeks i believe it's five maybe six to be exact um and now we would be thinking about or having conversations about moving to the next phase, which would be hybrid. On this slide, it kind of shows the pictorial version. So if you were to be in group A on Mondays and Tuesdays, you would be in school. And then on Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, you would be virtual. If you were in group B, you would be in school on Thursdays fr and Fridays and you would be virtual on Mondays, Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Our challenge and our hope is to have siblings together whenever possible. Um, so if siblings are together, if, if siblings were to go to school, we would want them all in school on Monday and Tuesday if possible. There are some instances 
where siblings may get specialized services like EL services or special ed services or, you know, any other special ed services, speech and language um, or the such that may hinder us from having every sibling together. But the goal and the idea is that families don't have separate um, students going on A, on A versus B. And then of course the cyber piece is no live lessons. So it's all asynchronous. Now that may not be something that's popular because a lot of the parents are beginning to get the hang of the virtual setting. But unfortunately, when we move to hybrid, the, um, the master teacher will likely be teaching two separate groups, one group on Monday and Tuesday and one group on Thursday and Friday. And as they begin to get into the meat and potatoes of their lessons, they are going to learn and find out that there's gonna need to be some differentiation. And for that differentiation to happen would mean that they wouldn't necessarily be at the same place at the same time with both groups. That being the case, they're left to plan for two separate groups. And then if they kept the virtual I, um, option, manage that as a third thing to manage, as well as any Bearcat cyber thing responsibilities that they may have. That seems like a lot to juggle. So we kind of presented the decision as a team that we feel like the Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday with virtual is the best option to be able to give kids more time. Right now, kids are um, getting a virtual lesson um, twice a day um, for, let's say, a span of two hours total, and their other work is virtual. If they came back hybrid, they would be getting seven hours of direct instruction or six and a half of hours of direct instruction twice a week, giving them 13, 13 hours in a week of instruction. So we would be essentially doubling their instruction time directly. Again, um, nothing new on this slide, just district considerations for prevention, all of which are all listed in the um, handbook and just kind of being very diligent about hand washing, disinfecting. If we went to the hybrid model, we would be doing a Monday, Tuesday, and then Wellness Wednesday would continue, but that would be our opportunity for our, um, for our maintenance and cleaning staff to be able to do some of the deeper disinfecting that needs to go on as a result of having two separate groups in the building. So um, that would give them the opportunity to do so. And then of course our transportation, um, again, nothing different here, but um, looking at, you know, of course, transporting, continuing to transport our students um, for special ed and then those across 30 and as well as our STEAM Academy kids. Our school building entrance screening process would be the same that, that we are using now, except that we would have more students that would be entering. So social distancing would have, we'd have to be much more diligent, vigilant about that because we have so many kids that would be entering the, the buildings. So um, other than that, there's nothing different from when we talked about this the last time. And again, food services, um, the only addition to this is the bullet that has the K-12. So students that are doing Bearcat Cyber will continue to be able to receive their meals between 11 and 1 um, at their homeschool buildings Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday as they with the double up on Tuesday. And hopefully the double up for the weekend if that goes through which was what Mr. Um, Mr. Kamizak was talking about. There's our 
district considerations about tr um, transitioning. Of course, the mask is to be worn by all students and staff all day. Um, we're going to be limiting um, movement as much as we possibly can and um, consider having students stay and teachers move when possible. And the last district consideration has to do with conducting large group gatherings. Again, nothing different, um, just making sure that we're vigilant about um, the disinfecting procedures after large group gathering and measure to be considered on a case by case basis when we need to do um, a deep cleaning for whatever reason that we have a protocol and process to do that. And our district considerations about um, symptoms or students that become sick at school listed before you. Um, also, you will see that we've added to refer to the York City um, Handbook for Identified Procedures. Um, we are also creating some flow charts that kind of pictorially illustrate if this, then that. So. Um, we have some draft copies of that in your, um, that were sent to you all today. So certainly we are about the PPE, making sure we have the mask. We, ha we are getting this plexiglasses up in as many places as we possibly can. We are saying, staying as safe as we possibly can. The um, maintenance staff um, is beginning to put hand sanitizer in the, the um, hand sanitizer stations that are outside the classrooms. Those classrooms that are being utilized currently have hand sanitizer and PPE in their rooms. We're going to begin the process of filling the others as, as we need to do so, as we are having um, students coming in for appointments, et cetera. We're making sure that we have the, the, the hand sanitizer and everything that they need around them. Surrounding districts um, in our county, um, as you can see, basically they have pretty much, they're, they're most, most of them are doing the same thing. They are either reopen with a remote option or hybrid with a remote option. Um, several of them, I believe two or three of them have meetings tomorrow to move from um, hybrid to total reopen. And um, a couple of them are adding hybrid in a different way with more days. So our Wellness Wednesdays are continuing. We're still doing them. I certainly want to um, give a shout out to not just the street team, but the street team as well as all, all of the folks that were on the committee that kind of decided that we were going to do the Wellness Wednesdays. They have been um, very successful. Um, I have a piece of data that I want to share. We are in our sixth week of home visits with one visit per week and three hour deployments. Um, so we've had approximately 18 hours of street time with five partnering agencies and community volunteers. And we have visited 400 homes. I certainly think that is noteworthy of a shout out. So we appreciate you team for um, all of your efforts. And during these um, street team visits, their wellness visits, but we're also checking in on technology and trying to find out if there's any other needs that we can meet if they need um, hot spots at home, if they need um, food boxes and they can't get to the district to get them, if we can bring them out to them. So we're meeting as many specific needs as we possibly can. And um, another shout out to our technology team. They have deployed, deployed 2,100 devices for our K-4 students district-wide within a two-week span. That's pretty impressive, 
given the fact that most people that do a one-to-one -one initiative generally do it over the span of a one to two year process. This isn't something that usually happens in two weeks. Um, the APs um, and the schools played a major role in this as well. They've been kind of the folks that were doing the deployments with technology at the schools. So shout out to them. Um, as you can see, we have about 200 devices across the district that we need to get distributed until we would be considered one-to-one. -one. And we have the schools where they need to be. There's 75 at McKinley, 32 at Good, and uh, 70 at Hannah Penn. So the rest of the schools are considered one-to-one -one at this point. And that is that if there is a device in a, in a, that has been given out in a K-4, we didn't necessarily collect the device that was there if there was another kid in the household. So we're trying to slowly make sure that each kid has a device assigned to them. So within the next couple of weeks, we're hoping that the next time we talk to you will be even closer to one-to-one. -to -one. So we're 200 away right now. I think that's pretty impressive given the fact that we, we weren't even close um, at the beginning, so. And finally, um, the next steps are, we're gonna continue to collect and monitor data for informed decision-making. Um, we're gonna you know, communicate preliminary plans for transparency to district teachers and staff, as well as families as soon as possible. We'll be using website updates. We'll be using robocalls and emails and app notifications. We'll continue to use social media and US mail and any other communication forms that we can. As you know, I'm a seven times seven ways person and I wanna get out as much information as I possibly can. So if indeed um, we went with the recommendation um, the recommendation that I would be putting forth would be for us to consider the hybrid model, model beginning November 9th, which would give us a couple of weeks before Thanksgiving break, and then a return from Thanksgiving break to be um, fully hybrid, two days a week with an AB schedule. And I will take your questions now. This is Director Kennedy. I have a couple of questions. Um, <clears throat> just going back to the beginning and talking about um, looking at the counties alongside of us um, being moderate and um, the great concern about our numbers continuing to go up. I'm concerned about considering making a shift to hybrid from when we made the initial decision to remain um, virtual, go all virtual for this period of time um, our numbers are spiking then, and our numbers are continuing to spike while we're heading into the fall and, and flu season and um, the understanding from epidemiologists that this virus will continue to, to increase. So I, I'm very concerned about having more people in the building. Um, that is just my personal opinion and my concern around that. Um, so related to that, um, can you talk a little bit about what the class size is going to be, even though we were you're talking about doing an AB um, day for, for students? Um, can you talk a little bit about what that's going to, to look like in, around class size numbers? So the district average class size is 26. So if we have 50% of the kids in at one time, that would bring us down to 13 per class. Okay, and what, what is our cap number going to be? Should there be a couple of classes that they need, maybe one or two more? What is, what is, are we going to have a cap? Maybe that's the question to ask. We probably will need to discuss a cap, but um, the, with the, with us being free and appropriate public education, a cap means opening another class. A cap doesn't mean you know, we can't have the kids come to school. So um, that's not what I'm saying. I'm, I'm, I'm saying. No, no, no. I, I understand what you're saying. I'm just saying, you know, we, we need to plan for that because if we have an overage of students, we're going to have to consider opening up additional classrooms. Right. 
which is what I agree with, but I'm just just wanting wanting to put out there the thought around um, we really need to be intentional about not having these class sizes be <clears throat> anything remotely close to um, uh, what it would be toward full in person. And then on the slide where you talked about um, what large group gatherings would look like, uh, what kind of number are we talking about for for, for that, because I didn't even think that we would be discussing. Well, large group gatherings being an outdoor. So we're not planning on doing any indoor okay. um, large group gatherings. Okay. All right. Just, just making sure. And then um, my last question, I think, um, when you talked about the, the street teams and the contacts and touches that we've had, um, thus far in these past six weeks can you can you elaborate on who those other partner agencies are that are that are joining the district on these street team walks so we have the what is that slide Toward the end. We have our community volunteers that are going out with them. They're taking um, district staff, of course, is going out being social workers and or um, guidance counselors. Um, they have, when it is necessary, um, the um, J G G J G G J G I G G T I people going with certain ones, not all. Um, the that's the. Are you saying G V I? Yes. And um, they're having some of the counselors go out if they need to. So CIS, some of the CIS people are going out with them when necessary. And um, Wellspan is going out as well when necessary. If there's a specific need that is elicited, then Wellspan will go out with them. Or if they are asking for specific services, someone from either CIS, Presley Ridge, CSBBH will go out as well. Can you give me an example of, of um, the need for, for GVI to be going out with our district team? I, I can't, but I'm certain that I can get one and get back to you with it. Okay. And only because I think the street team idea is, is a great idea and I, and I really like it. Um, and I'm not opposed even to additional agencies um, that are going in the way of uh, of supports, but I just I just think that these are supposed to be wellness checks and um, support checks um, around needs for kids, whether it's technology issues or device issues or um, um, finding out academic academic needs. I'm just concerned about including GVI, and I said this before, so I'm repeating myself, but GVI, JPO. Uh, I'm concerned about doing those kinds of checks. Um, well, and I'm not necessarily sure. Like I said, I can't speak directly to why. I do know that the GVI guys took bags along with them and gave out bags the the first the first go round. They were giving out um, treat bags with alongside of our um, school police, so they weren't there for a threatening purpose the first time they went out. I think it was like week two. But I, I can't speak directly to if they're going out for other re reasons now. Um, but I will get that information and get back to you. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. This is um, Director Bryant. Um, you said that you weren't doing um, indoor gatherings? L large group gatherings, yes. Large group, okay. Because I did see a slide where you said something about using the gym for indoor gatherings. You, but not large groups, so nothing over, you know, capacity. Yeah, At twenty percent, twenty percent capacity. 
So they use the gym for volleyball games, but only at 20% capacity. Okay. So and that would be considered a large gathering. Right. Same thing with a basketball game or. Okay. And uh, on the street teams, is, is how do they de select their um, homes that they go to? They get they get lists from the schools, either the social workers, um, the teachers, the nursing staff. Um, if there are the technology team, you need to go by here because this this specific device is being misused. Or um, so it's a variety of of folks that say, hey. So they give the street teams the list. Um, the social worker and a guidance counselor are kind of heading up who, you know, the, the list and, and kind of saying, well, here's who the hot list folks are. And I think the attendance officers are also was, involved that in that was my next. That was my next um, question. Mm -hmm. Were you cross-referencing with attendance? Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions for Dr. Barry? Dr. Barry, I have one. Yes. And my question has to do with what will be our cutoff or threshold for number of students that would have to test positive for COVID before we transition back from the hybrid to a um, virtual model? I don't know what the, no, I don't think that there's a number. Like if we, each case is a, it's, it's a case by case basis. Um, if we had at one time, I would say if we had more than five or six in a day, I would say that would be a, a, a substantial amount that we would need to say, hey, we, we, we might need to relook at what we're doing. Um, neighboring districts have had as many as five at a time and have closed down for two weeks and then reopened. Um, so the beauty of having a built out <clears throat> plan with all three models is you can move back and forth if you need it to. Um, but to answer your question, um, if we had a, a, a huge number like that, like, a, like over five or six, um, I think it would certainly warrant a conversation about, hey, maybe this might have been so, you know, too fast. Thank you, Dr. Barry. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Um, I know we, you, you're saying the number five or six that um, you would possibly close down for. But if, if I, my recollection is correct, we've had in our district, maybe uh, in a certain building one, and they closed down for, for two weeks. Again, if we have a situation that warrants us to close, you know, there's, there's different types of exposure class one exposure, class two exposure, class three exposure. And based on what the exposure is, like I was at my cousin's aunt's sister's house, but I never was in a room with him, but he tested positive, you know, is very different than I was with someone who was positive in the same room at this, you know, so that contact tracing situation, the research behind that, which is yet very time consuming, but very necessary hard work that has to be done to, to get an accurate picture of what's going on. So I think, you know, that is when we start doing that. And, and honestly, you, you're better safe than sorry in a lot of these situations. So, you know, when we closed down Jackson, we had reason to close it down. We, we felt that, you know, the data that we had was saying, mm, we had too many potential exposures at that time, and we just felt like that was the best decision for that building. We had another situation at Good where it wasn't the same type of exposure. And according to the guidance and guidelines, um, we, we use 
each we, we treat each case as an individual case. So it's not that you open a book and say, if there's an exposure, you do this, this, and this. It just depends on the data that you get from the exposure, what you're going to do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Mary, this is Director Kennedy again. You mentioned that, that we, we had, do we have a case at Good? Because this is the first I'm hearing of that. So we had a, we had a, a potential case at first and then a case at Good, yes. But that was the first one that we had. That was before the Jackson one. Never heard of it. Yep. But okay, thank you. This is Director Brown. Uh, Dr. Berry, I just wanted to thank you for the update. And I'm well aware of all the uh, precautions and the, um, the tracing, because we do it here with, you know, at my job to across the across seven states. It's hard to keep track of, but <laughs> you know, we get daily, daily reports. Mm -hmm. um, but I did want to ask you, um, how many um, parents or, you know, is there a ratio of parents that actually take advantage of the uh, Wednesday um, buildings being open, um, in particular, the four to seven um, time slot? Yes, we do have quite a bit and I don't have the exact data. I planned on having it for board meeting. Um, I don't have the exact numbers, but um, we do have quite a bit because they have so many resources right. and I'll try to get you a breakdown of who's seeing who, like what we're seeing. I know there are some kids that are coming in um, that are going to be coming in for the after school program on Wednesdays. I know they are having some parents that are coming in to get technology help. I don't know that it's an enormous amount, but I'll try to get you some numbers, Miss Diane. Okay, I, I I don't really need the numbers. I was just wondering since we, you know, out of it's consideration. Been, I, I, it's been sports. enough that if we stopped, I think it would be detrimental. So um, if we right. said no more Wellness Wednesday, parents would say, "Why?" You know, I I think it's been enough that you know. Yeah, I, I was uh, sitting in on a Zoom meeting with um, Sandy Walker, and um, I know we, uh, I thought about it when we were uh, talking, um, you know, my heart's always with the parents, and I just thought it was very considerate that we offered that time slot for the parents that work during the day. And I was just wondering, I don't, I don't need a breakdown. Okay. I was just wondering how well it was being, um, or parents were participating in it. Mm -hmm. That's all I wanted. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Barry, one last question. Yes, when, when the students come back on their A and B days, will it be pretty much contained to a certain area of the building? You know, the classrooms will like they won't be all scattered. Will they or will they not be scattered with throughout the building or just in a certain area? They'll probably be scattered because that's the best way for us to social distance, Ms. Carmen. So if like the eighth graders would probably be in the eighth, seventh and eighth grade wing, because that's, you know, if we put them all downstairs together, we're not going to be able to, to social distance. So I would say, yes, that we would be pretty much using as much of the building as we can, include, okay. including areas like cafeteria um, and um, encore rooms when possible, media centers. So we would be using every available space that we could to make sure we were social distancing. And has, has there been any um, um, consideration in hiring um, more um, custodians per building? Because I think right now we have, what, one plant manager or one custodian there first thing in the morning for so many hours. You know, has there been any, any consideration for that? We have had some conversations about it and it has come up a couple of times. So I think that it, it will certainly be in the works if we decided to move in this direction. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any additional questions? Director or? Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm really impressed with the equipment. I, I hadn't seen any of it until I was up at the administration building when I went through the apparatus to take your, take your temperature. Mm -hmm. Really impressed. And I know those are in all of our buildings. Uh, and the reason why I'm saying that is I have uh, relatives going to other school districts 
and none of those districts have what we have in our schools. They don't have none of those apparatuses. They, they just don't, unless these people are, are not telling me the truth. But I, I'm just really impressed that we are doing everything that we can to protect our kids and staff. I was just so impressed with that. And I even saw my temperature and I was fine going into the building. Yeah, I, I just wanted to relay that to you uh, with the staff and everybody who's doing such a magnificent job on keeping those buildings clean, spotless, and all the equipment. And, and that's a financial addition for us, getting all this extra equipment put in those buildings. Well, Very certainly, yeah, certainly a testament. Thank you, Mrs. Award. Certainly a testament to um, the maintenance staff um, and the security team. They're doing a lot of work with those temperature machines trying to make sure that they're getting the kids' temperatures taken and the staff temperatures taken. So, um, you know, um, when, when, when you're like me, I come in in the morning and Miss Annette teases me because I have to jump to, to get to my forehead because I can't, I can't reach the, um, the, um, the, the temperature thing. And when I was putting my wrist on it, it, it was reading um, really low. So they told me I needed to do my forehead. So I have to run yeah. and like jump. <laughs> so yeah, they make she, fun of me. Yeah, because yeah, she told me, she said, now Ms. Zoe, you got to turn around so you can see what your temperature was. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Very impressed. Yeah. Very impressed yeah. with that machine. Yeah. Uh, to be quite honest, we, you know, we're crossing our fingers and hoping um, Mr. Um, Chuck has been working really, work really hard with his team because as it's getting colder, they're beginning to start reading a little low. So we're just making sure that we want to make sure that they remain accurate. Um, so again, like they told me that my, doing it on my wrist probably wasn't a good idea that I needed to do it on my forehead. So I'm, I'm getting um, a couple of extra jumps in a day. So <laughs> Very good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so board members, we have some item, other items here for discussion. If you want to peruse those and pull out whichever ones you want to discuss. Uh, President Sweeney, D. Okay, OSS Health Physician Services Agreement. Yes. And this one, Director Kennedy, I'd like to pull C and E, please. C and E? Yes, C and D. Um, C and E, I'm sorry. Repeat that, Miss Kennedy. C as in Carmen, E as in Eddie. I thought that's what you said. So if we could have someone speak to C, CPC first 10, play and learn. Dr. Kozer. Or maybe I can ask my questions and. Yep, go ahead. Okay. Um, the first one really, um, is around how how does the implementation of this program change or has it um, due to our current COVID situation and, and virtual educating? What does the program look like? How how has it um, how will it be impacted by um, COVID and virtual educating? Absolutely. So this agreement is. Um, an annual agreement as part of our 21st Century Community Learning Center's grant. So this will happen every year for all five years of the grant. Um, the way it's changed for this fall is the committee that's building out the play and learns. The majority of them this fall will be virtual and we'll be reaching out to families in that virtual space. Again, as the board directs us to change our learning models in the school district, we will also change our play and learn models. So for example, if we would move to hybrid, we would move to a smaller um, socially distanced in-person play and learn program as well. So we're gonna follow the learning formats that the district has in place for this program. Okay, and then how many families are we anticipating or looking for to participate in the program? What we love about this is that the play and learns are targeted at the younger siblings of students in the after school program. They're open to the birth to five group, 
with the school age um, children. And so at each of the schools that are in the grant, we're hoping to connect with probably 20 to 25 in this virtual first cohort um, and then build on that throughout the school year. We had a, a plan ready to roll Saturday mornings, play and learns in the school gymnasiums. Just literally, it would have been the Saturday after we closed for COVID. So we were set and ready to go um, and had received a lot of positive feedback. So we're going to start small virtually and hopefully build that out and expand across the school year. Okay, and then my um, last question is, um, does the program have uh, maybe even at the end of each year or at the end of the five-year term, but does the program have a post-assessment tool that will be able to in easily indicate <clears throat> um, student growth and value in the program for those who participated versus those who did not? At this point, we're focusing mainly on the parent perceptions and the parent relationships with the school. Um, the majority of our first 10 focus is really on connecting our families with young children to the school buildings as early and as young as possible. And so more of it is going to be parent perception data because we are working with those birth to five-year-olds that we won't necessarily have the, the student achievement measures that we would have for school age children. Okay. Thank you. That's my last question. Okay, moving on to item D, the OSS Health Physician Services Agreement. Ms. Director, I mean, President Sweeney, you had a concern to our question? Yes, my question was basically, okay, we have the physician um, to, for support for our um, sports team. Is that eliminating our trainer? Well, we have both. Hello? Ms. Thomas, is that your contract? Uh, it really, it shouldn't even be on because there have to be adjustments that have to be made. So it, um, it's not ready for you all to review yet because there are some changes that have to be made per Mr. Gettle. So I, I don't know why it's on. So we're not ready to present it to you yet. <laughs> It's, it's part of that whole contract with our trainer and OSS, yes. So that one will be removed for, for later consideration? Yes, because um, Mr. Ghetto already reviewed it and there have to be some changes made and we he made the changes, we just we haven't had the chance to send it to them yet. So it really shouldn't have been on. But that's, it was just a miscommunication. So it'll be taken off. So you won't have it for the voting meeting on Wednesday. It, okay. We revisit it in November. All right. Thank you. You're and then we have letter E, Comcast agreement. That was Miss Kennedy. You had a concern? Or yes. Question? Not a concern, just a question. Oh, I think I'm on mute. No, I'm not. Um, Dr. Berry, can you just confirm whether this is the same? This this is for the contract for those families in the housing authority addresses like we talked about last last month. Is that correct? That is correct. And it's also the ones that the Martin Library is doing as well. So we have a contract with them. Well, we have a agreement with them as well. They're providing hot spots as well. And so the contract is just memor um, memorandum. Um, it's just language saying that they're giving them to us. We're not necessarily the, the ones from they're a match for. Right, <laughs> right. So. Okay, and so then um, is there any, and this probably is, is, is a no, but is there any responsibility that, that the household or family has to um, maintain in order to, to participate in this, receiving the service? Well, they have to take care of the device because if they're, if they're, if they're not taking care of the device, we will have to take it back. So um, other than that, no. You, okay, do you mean so like for them to get the device is that what you're asking no not necessarily to get the device i just meant like once the once once a household receives that device through this particular program with comcast is there a responsibility on the, on the family to at like you just mentioned uh, maintain the device or anything and so therefore are they um signing off as any indication that they understand what those responsibilities are and are there any uh, consequences um should there be issues with devices. So um, 
the team is telling me it's a code now. It's not a it's not a hot spot. It's just a oh, code. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. So it's no resp- responsibility on family except that they have to they have to live in our boundaries. They have to be a part of York City School District. That's the only Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Any other questions? Any other remarks? Yes, um, Dr. Berry, um, yes, are, we, are we finding uh, with the district, or are we finding um, quite a few parents who have not um, signed up with their, with the Comcast communication, you know, getting their hotspot or? Um, it's, it's not as many as one may think, um, less than 7%. So um, we are getting, we're, we're getting that number down quickly. When we did the initial surveys, um, it, it was less than 5%. So we've, we've gone around and have, have found out in, um, from Wellness Wednesdays and our street team visits that some folks needed some internet connections that were faster. And so that is when um, the partnership kind of was birthed between um, the housing authority and the the district as well as the library. So um, they they've used all thirty eight of the hot spots that we were given um, with the partnership from Martin Library. So they um and we use they're used on, for the students that are at the child care. So the kids that are getting child care at um the various child care agencies around the city we made sure that they had access there as well. Yeah, I just had a, I had a concern um, maybe with um, attendance, because I think our policy says that if they're not signed up, if they're not online or something, we couldn't uh, account their attendance. Am I correct? If they're not set up, we can't account their attendance, but I'm looking at it once the information is disseminated to the family and then they still do not respond or reply, what happens then? Well, that just, it depends, again, that's a case by a case basis. So if, let's just, let, let's just put a, um, a hypothetical out there because I don't, I don't have any specific instances to give you, but hypothetically, there's a family of four or more in one household. If there's only one device in the household, we mm-hmm. cannot mark attendance for access. So no, I, just, I would understand that. I'm just mm-hmm. talking about in incidents where, um, you know, the, the family has been, you know, been communicated with and they still are not online. They still have not done what they were supposed to do. How's that accounted for attendance? Well, we're beginning to talk about, cause CDC, the, the CDC, I'm, I'm sorry, the PDE guidelines are, are are given a lot of grace right now. They're not, you know, they're not, They at one point they weren't allowing a lot of accountability, but as we begin to release um, and move towards other methods, the accountability stakes are getting higher. So we are looking at attendance and taking it very seriously We are making sure that um, students are on, they're getting lists of students that are not checking in and going out to the homes with the street team saying, hey, you're on the list this week that you've not checked in for four days or three days. And if you don't check in, it's gonna become an attendance problem. So yes, we, we um, we are holding them more accountable now than we were last year when we were just kind of giving a lot of grace Okay. That's Thank not you. the case. That's not the case now. So. Thank you. Superintendent's remarks. I have no more. <laughs> With that being said, Madam President, that concludes Ed programs. Thank you. Next, we have Director Rivera. With your finance committee. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, all's president, all's present, <laughs> all's present, 
All present uh, for the Finance Committee. Uh, got any presentations from the superintendent? Anyone? You have any items for discussion? We have our reports here. Our monthly financial report, our receipt ledgers and our deposits reports. You all received them earlier. You had a chance to look over them. Anybody have any discussions on them? We also had cash disbursements um, for September. Um, did you have a chance to look over your cash disbursements also? Anyone have any discussions? No questions for me, um, Director Rivera. Okay, any Director other Rivera? Remarks? Yes, sir. I do have a question in terms of the um, our recovery plan and our finances. And just, just a brief discussion, Dr. Barry, in regards to how are we doing with our finances in regards to our recovery plan and meeting the needs of the district. Well, as it relates to the, um, the current budget and recovery plan, we are doing we are doing fairly well. Uh, we are in the middle of our audit and um, Mr. Diffendall can speak more specifically about the audit, but we have some preliminary data that is tracking us being on track thus far. Is that correct, Mr. Diffendall? Yeah, that's correct, Dr. Barry. It's obviously it's very early for the 2021 school year. Uh, <laughs> the fact that uh, we've had about a month and a half of payroll uh, you know, with the teachers starting in mid-August and the support folks, the 10-month support folks starting, you know, that third week or so, fourth week of August. So it's a little bit of a later start and we've had three months of revenue, but we've really only had about a solid month, month and a half of expenditures related to salaries and, and uh, back to school costs. So it's a little early to project 2021 uh, from that perspective. Um, but certainly uh, uh, the numbers continue to, uh, to trend favorably and we will continue uh, beginning in November, start the review process for the 2021 forecast as well as starting the budget for 21-22. So with that being said, Mr. Diffendall, the district is being fiscally responsible in terms of making sure that we're not overspending in some areas and not making purchases that are not necessarily needed at this time. Director Breland, you, what you said is exactly correct. Uh, so in the, in the business office, we have three people that review every invoice. Uh, we are not seeing any unnecessary, superfluous uh, expenditures. Um, that are taking place. It is uh, within budget. I've met with most of the principals to go over their budget. Uh, Dr. Gloucester has uh, talked to the principals about their title funds. Uh, so we are uh, putting some more uh, uh, controls and reviews in place to make sure that we do not have any uh, unnecessary or superfluous expenditures. Uh, obviously we need to support education but we, we needed to be smart about how we do it. And we've been able to do that uh, through the, the first three months of this uh, new school year. So I'm just, just trying to get a look at what happens if we do go to a hybrid model. We will see some increased costs because of we're having more people in the building, more utility uses, more water usage and things of that nature. But that's, that's it should still be saving us because we're not in the full-time mode. Absolutely. Uh, from a transportation standpoint, you see cost savings, just something very simple like crossing guards in a fully, uh, essentially fully virtual setting, you're not incurring that cost. Uh, then obviously going back to a hybrid, some of those costs will restart or come on to, come, in, come online, if you will. 
uh, as we as we begin to go more face to face, the 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 A and B cohorts uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, we will start to see some additional costs associated with that. Um, but still, again, the point you made is absolutely valid. That if if we pick a school that normally has 700 kids and only 65% or so of the kids end up coming back uh, in the hybrid model, that's, that's 420 kids uh, and 210 in the A group, roughly 210 in the B group, as opposed to 700 every day. Uh, so with obviously with, with uh, Wednesday being wellness, continuing to be wellness Wednesdays. So mm -hmm. cost savings incurred. We do have people on furlough, um, which you know, as we go back to face to face in a hybrid mode, some of those folks will will likely be coming back. So, as the governor looks at their budgets and how they're going to project for the upcoming school year past this one, would they basically just keep it at a flat rate? How would that work? Or have you heard any discussion in regards to that? Uh, we have not gotten any guidance from PDE on what they anticipate for the 21-22 school year. Um, I know that uh, uh, the state of Pennsylvania has is continuing to go. Initially, they passed a five-month budget for everyone except education. And they're almost kind of going month by month, if you will in all the non-educational uh, expenditures uh, throughout the Commonwealth. Um, obviously they're taking a wait and see uh, because they really, to forecast what's going to happen going forward is a very difficult uh, uh, assumption to make as tax revenues continue to lag due to the economy not fully reopened uh, and certainly not clicking on all the cylinders that we saw prior to COVID. So it's a, uh, you know, a state that's very heavily influenced by uh, sales and use tax and income taxes on corporations and individuals. Um, it, it's, it's very early. Uh, I know there are still lots of uh, concern in Harrisburg about future revenues, which will impact us. Um, it'll be very difficult for the district to continue moving forward and making good strides that they're making if the state flat funds us for 21-22. Did they flat fund us this year? I'm trying to remember our conversation. Yes, yes they did. I, that's what I thought. And, it was, and they flat funded us very late in the process. Yes. It created a lot of the uh, uh, last minute changes, if you will, in, in uh, May and June to get the budget finalized uh, to meet the deadlines of June 30. So yes, um, for the district, for our district, State revenue is about $105 million. Standardly, all of that is the basic subsidy. Uh, and that, so that amounts, if you assume an inflation factor of two and a half percent, is about $2.7 million uh, that the district for, for, you know, was, was, uh, was not funded for the 2021 school year by Harrisburg. Uh, I certainly would, would hope that we do not have that same challenge for 21-22. All right. Thank you, Mr. Diffendahl. Sure, absolutely. And certainly, if as we hear more or we get, uh, if PDE tips their cap a little bit, we will certainly uh, uh, bring that back to the board because that would entail some, some other things that would need to take place. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diffendahl. Any other remarks? Superintendent, do you have any remarks? No, I think I've said enough. <laughs> that concludes the report for the Finance Committee, President Sweeney. Okay, our next, uh, Tanya um, Morgan Thompson, she's not here today, our chairperson for general policy. You have the items before you. Can look over them. Anybody want to pull, have any conversation about them? The policy 123, interscholastic sports, athletics. Yes, 
Madam President, just have a question in regards to policy 123, Interlast Interscholastic Athletics. I know that we got a copy of this and I have it in my hand now, but I know that the board have, was having conversation in regards to making some changes in regards to passing grades. And I just would like to take this time for the board members to have their conversation about this policy and where our thoughts are. Does everyone have a copy of the policy? If this if it's the same policy from last month, um, I still have a copy, but my if, tablet was not uh, I'm having problems with the tablet. So, if there was an update to it, I don't have it. There's some updates, I believe. So, I believe it was revised on the 23rd of September 2020. September 23rd was revised. Yes. This is Miss Thomas. You have the most updated revised copy. Okay, thank you, Ms. Thomas. Thank you. You're welcome. You, you would have to open it up to see it. Well, my first question had to do with this, and, and this is for the board members, in terms of when we we're talking about grading and passing grades for our athletes, were we talking about an overall 2.0 or were we, the board discussing them having a 2.0 in every class? That wasn't clear to me. I just wanted to ask for some clarification. This is Director Kennedy, Mr. Brilliant. I, th I thought it was every class, but I could be wrong. Director Director Kennedy, that's why I was bringing it up again so that we could all be on one accord with what we're yeah, thinking and how we move forward with this. Question. That was yeah. my thinking also. That's not the way it's wrote in this policy. Okay, what's the 2.0? A C. A C. A C. It, 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 it wrote in this policy that everybody got, has got to have a C in each grade. Each subject. <sighs> It says that a number one, the student athlete must pass all courses, pass all courses yes. or better. Failure to meet this criterion will result in the following. The student athlete who are not passing all coursework with a C or better at the end of a school week will not be allowed to participate in interscholastic athletic contestant or games for a period of one week as Sunday through Saturday. That that right there sums it up. Is there anything else that we should know, know about? Honestly, I'm asking the question. Is there something else? Yeah, that I'm, I was trying to talk, but I had myself on mute. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> okay. Miss <laughs> <laughs> Thomas, correct me if I'm wrong. Is the anticipated changes that the board had talked about? Yes, sir. Everything highlighted in yellow. Okay. So then we further talk about students who are not passing. Mr. Breland, you're garbled. Like, we yeah. couldn't hear you. We can't hear what you're saying. Yeah, it's okay. like you're away from can the you hear? Can you hear me now? Yes, now we can. Okay, so it says further. Nope, you don't want to just went out again, Mr. Breland. Be mute. For yeah. some reason, I keep getting muted and it's doing it on its own. I guess there's a poltergeist here or something. That's what I just hear right say. You got a ghost, like my mama would say, the ghost did it. <laughs> <laughs> so they're saying something about the students who are not passing will not be allowed to participate for at least, what, 15 school days? That's actually three weeks. That's no, correct. That's, atten well, that's, oh. attendance. that's attendance. No, it's it said they no, can't do that no. week. That's no. week. You know what? It actually does say that students who are at the end of a semester. <clears throat> Can we put the uh, changes on the screen, please? Yeah, because I'm reading it. I'm looking at it. It says we're not. Yeah, that everybody don't have it. I don't think. 
No, I'm reading it, but my for whatever reason, mine does not come up highlighted. So you're looking at the fifth. When you look at the 15 days, it starts talking about the end of a marking period. Right. The first I one is telling you. Uh, the first one is telling you to see if you have if you're failing. You have a week. You get they're giving you a week to sit out. That means you got to bring your grades up within that yes. week. Yes. If you don't bring your grades up within that week, you're still sitting out. And if within that marking period, if you don't bring your grades up, then you're sitting out for 15 days. Right. And yeah. after that, if you don't sit it out at the end of that marking period, that semester, if they're not out, then you're sitting out for another more 15 days. That's and basically what they're telling you. And they're saying a student can't miss no more than 15 days or more in the school days in that semester. So it's basically telling the FBK, knuckle down. That's how I read it. Are we waiting for it to come up on the screen? I know Mrs. Uh, Ms. Just there? Ms. I asked for it to come up on the screen. Yes, yeah, you I, did. I, yeah, I heard you. That's what I'm saying. It's just there. Right. <laughs> My dog is acting like a mess. We need page three. Yeah, page three. Go to page three. Right hey. there. Thank you, Jess. You're very welcome. This is Director Orr. Go ahead. Um, reading this in yellow, self-explanatory. Now, why would we allow any student, you know, these kids are, are very smart. And yes, don't, we should not allow them to get away with any of this anything less than a C, come on, no. And I've heard that too. Even teachers, a staff teacher wanted us to allow the kids to play sports who have Ds. Give me a break, please. No, no. A C, come on. And that's cutting it short because they can do better than Cs. These kids' R's are very smart. Unless, and, and we got to keep them up on that pedestal and make them achieve their goals. Yes, ma'am. That's yeah, right. You're, you're, cool. you're yeah. correct, Director Orr. That's why we want to we wanted them to change this policy that they had to have at least a C. Yes, they yes. need to have that C. Nothing less. Nothing less. If they want to play sports that bad, believe me, they will keep that C and above because most of them will strive to go above that C. That's right. Yep. So this is this is self-explanatory. This needs to stay exactly like it is. No changes. This is fine. And my thought is this. We talk about increasing rigor across the district. How do we talk about increasing rigor if we also don't work on raising the expectations? And I don't believe that a student who is maintaining, who can't maintain a C, that would go against that, that trend of increasing rigor and maintaining an average. I want to say this, the students are athletes, or students first, athletes second. That's right. And That's right. Right. academics right. need to be held accountable. What are we going to do? Tell our students that they can go out here in this world and be mediocre and expect to make it and get by? No. No. Okay, I, I agree with all of that. First of all, um, my conversation last month on this was regarding the virtual learning environment our students are in right now. We don't, we don't have any statistics of, of how the virtual learning is affecting anyone's grades, whether they're students or 
musicians, you know, it, it doesn't matter. We, I just hate to see that we put this in effect in the middle of our pandemic that's going on. So when is this, when is this policy supposed to take effect if it's voted on? We didn't say that just yet. That's something that we would have to further discuss. And Director Brown, you did bring up a valid point because right. this, this virtual learning is new to some of our students. Yes, and I, 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 hear, I hear a lot of parents, not just York City School District, but a lot of parents from other mm -hmm. school districts who are hands-on parents that are having trouble with uh, the virtual learning environment, even connectivity issues. Uh, I know we're talking about Comcast um, providing this extra uh, code or whatever, but listen, I'm on Zoom probably four or five hours a day. And guess what? Sometimes I fall off. So I know, I know there's issues and I know some, some of our students, you know, they may have an instruction to do an assignment, no problem, but other students, they need that extra uh, handholding that may not be provided, be it uh, their fault or their parents' fault, what, what have you. Mm -hmm. uh, I know, again, we, we're having the parents come in on a Wednesday, but still, I think the, the district uh, doing something of this latitude during the middle of a pandemic is, is, is not right. I'm all for um, our students, student athletes achieving better than they are now, but I just don't think it's the right time to do it. Okay, excuse me, Director um, Diane, excuse, um, Brown. Um, this is a necessary saying that we want this in effect immediately, but this is a policy that I feel as though, and I think other board members agree, correct me if I'm wrong, that this is a policy that we do need to have on our books. We can make the effective date whenever. I mean, I also agree with, because we don't know what's going on with these grades, and how these students are actually learning. I understand that. It's not what we're speaking of. I don't believe that's what all of us are speaking about right now. And, but this is a policy that needs to be updated at this time and it needs to go on the books. We can make the effective date whenever, but however, uh, what's stated in this policy, I feel as though we need to move forward with. No, and again, I, I agree. I, I just don't want it to happen right now. And I think Listen, if we vote on a, a policy change, there has to be an effective date along with that. I agree, Director Brown. This is Director Breland. My question is to you, Dr. Barry, or someone in your administration in terms of technology and how we're moving forward with this. I too know that with students who are working with different learning styles, this type of learning may not meet that specific learning style and may pose challenges for that student. So with that being said, these are trying times and, I, and I'm with you here, Director Brown and Director Sweeney in terms of the policy need to be in effect, but we need to be strategic as to when we wanna put this into effect. And we need to know how virtual learning is impacting the students in their specific learning styles. And I don't know if Dr. Brown, Danielle Brown is on that she may weigh in or Dr. Barry. So we, we definitely probably need to have an effective date that's out further. Um, I, I agree with that. And, um, you know, hopefully if anyone has questions, they'll ask them before the voting meeting. Um, I, you know, you all seem to be at a good place with, with how you feel about the changes. Ideally, I think it should sit. I I, I kind of said that before, just so we are pro, we're proposing. You know, so giving parents a chance to look at the changes, ask questions. But if you want to move forward with it, that's certainly you're right. I, I, Dr. Barry, I strongly disagree about letting it sit because we have um, in the past have several things that we have let sit and they're still sitting. I think we need uh, to deal with. That's fine. With, you just need to have an effective date to make sure it's clear. Correct. We can, we, we can do that. We can put an effective date pending an effective date, but I feel as though we should move forward with it pending an effective date. 
but I don't think we should let it sit because I don't think we'll come back and, and visit it. We have too many things already sitting on the table that we haven't came back and visit. Well, Director Sweeney, Pres Madam President, this is one that I don't think that I would let slip by me and let it sit and not be addressed. I definitely am very invested in rigor in our district and it's being pushed in terms of our students working to do their best, but also agree with Director Brown in terms of how is this new mode of learning impacting the student's academic success at this time? And once we be able to, well, maybe we need to look into that. Yeah. Maybe we need to look into that. How is this technology impacting our students' learning styles? Hey, and well, yeah, I, I, I know I, that, I, I would just want to add this, let me add this last point. And I know that Dr. Livelsberger is very good at disaggregating data. And in a conversation that I had with him last year, when he was still administrating over at Jackson, he brought up a good point and I agree with him wholeheartedly. Once our students get it, our students are gonna be on fire and no one's gonna be able to stop them. So I think we have the know-how in the district. I think that now we just need to bring those heads together and be strategic on how we're going to implement this policy with an effective date and all those things that we need to examine in terms of student success. Okay. Okay. Am I clear in here? Is somebody else speaking? Yeah, this is the, uh, Director Riviera. There's another question here. Because I'm looking at this here and uh, the title, Interscholastic a Athletics. It was adopted November 16, 2005. It was re revised July 18, 2007. Now it was revised September 23rd, 2020. My question to you is, this was already in here that we could, that about the C's in this program? No. No. no, no that was no, never, no. that was, that was no, never that in this. No, no, no. This is Ms. Thomas. All the dates do for me is time stamp it so that I can document when we started working on it. The final. So telling, okay. So you're yeah, telling so me back in anything, 1976 when I was going to school that I didn't have to have a C in order to participate. Yes, you did. I know I did. I didn't have to have a C in order to participate in any activities. Ms. I know Rivera. I did have to have one because I couldn't participate if I didn't. Okay, so Ms. Rivera, they took I can't, things out of the school system. Wow. I can't speak to what happened in 1976 because I was not here. I know. But I'm telling my age. Uh, but that's okay. We, we all have them, and it's a good thing and a blessing to be here every day. So we just go keep that moving. What I'm saying to you is the changes in yellow or the, or the direction that the board has asked us to go. And the, the date is just a timestamp date so I can keep track of if we make a change, then we put the revised date. That's the date that we made the change. So we can keep right, track of what we made the changes. So I make sure that when we put this on the agenda, you have the most recent up-to-date copy with the most up-to-date revision. Okay, I got And you. I just Thank want you. to add this last point, if I may. And I don't want to put these requirements on our students without us also being able to provide them with vehicles that's going to help them be successful. We need to make certain that there are things put in place to help our students be successful so that they don't have to worry about being eligible. And I'm talking about teaching kids study skills, good study habits, and all of those things. And I think that we as a district owe it to our athletes to put those things in place. And I do know that with some of the study halls, I can't speak for all of them, that they do implement some of these strategies as well as some of the teachers in their classes teaching kids study skills and things of that nature. So hopefully we can make this a district wide effort in terms of helping our athletes at the high school and middle school level stay and stay successful and stay eligible. So I do want to make sure that we put things in place for them. Hopefully yeah, with these standards sure. here. Go ahead. Okay, I was going to say we also need to make sure our teaching staff, the instruction is effective online. We don't know, we don't have that information either. Uh, that could be a professional development for them also. You know, once we have the information from Dr. Leibelsberger, you know, we don't know how effective the teaching instruction is online. Right. Okay. What I'm hearing is two different things. And I want to be clear on what we're all saying. Um, I get it and I'm all for it and understand that what's going on right now in the pandemic 
um, teaching, learning, the whole nine yards is different. And to uh, all of a sudden just throw this on an athlete right now would be totally unfair. Well, I'm going to say it. I'm going to say how I feel about it. It would be totally unfair. However, in the same breath, this is a policy, I'm going to say it again, that needs to be taken care of. And at our next voting meeting, we need to vote on this policy, not voting on starting it right away, but vote on the policy. Once we get the data from Dr. L on how the, te- the children are learning and how the teacher are teaching and any other data that we need, then we can set an effective date. But again, I'm going to say, ask of the uh, board members at our next voting meeting to vote this policy into play. Not that we have to have the effective date to be today or next Thursday. Just the policy, voting on the policy, not when we're going to implement it. Well, I'll, I'll pose this question to uh, Attorney Gettle. With, the, with what um, uh, President Sweeney is stating, is that protocol acceptable and legal for us to vote on a policy without an effective date? Well, my, my recommendation would be if the board, if the consensus of the board is to want to vote uh, on this policy next, uh, next week at its voting meeting in terms of actually adopting the policy, there should be as part of that uh, resolution, something to indicate that it won't be effective immediately or it won't be effective until a certain date if, if the board can determine that. I don't like the idea of just adopting it because, in my opinion, once it's adopted, I don't know. Do I have a lot of uh, background noise? Yeah. We can hear you fine. Okay. Um, what I was going to say, I don't like the idea of just adopting it uh, without addressing the issue of making it uh, not effective immediately. Um, because, in my opinion, adopting it would put it in effect of, immediately. So. Part of that discussion next week, in my opinion, should be whether the resolution is also going to contain something that says it is not effective immediately or not effective until, um, you know, another resolution in the future to actually make it effective. Um, It can be adopted and approved, but I think a resolution should indicate that it won't will not take place or will not be effective immediately or will not be effective until a certain date in the future if the board can come to you know, some some discussion or consensus about that. Correct, that that's sense. what I just said. Yeah, that's okay. what I just, well, I just said. Right, I, 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 I just wanna make sure that part of the, of the uh, adopting it is that it will not be effective immediately or it, will, it won't be effective till a, a certain date if there can be a consensus on what that's gonna be. Right, so we have to make sure that the resolution is worded uh, correctly. Correct. Right. I think the, the present resolution on the uh, agenda makes no reference to the fact that it would not be uh, effective right. on adoption. Right. Thank you. So, can you see to doing that? We need to discuss what date we want it effective right now. Well, that can be part of the discussion tonight. I don't know if the uh, administration has any input on that, or if again we're we're dealing with issues of of uh, the pandemic and the effect of that. Uh, so, I but all that asked, can be. Wait a minute, no, sorry. no, no. I was asking a question. I don't think it's fair to de- to um, make that decision tonight. I was asking, does it have to be tonight, right now? Because we really can't say the effective date until we get the information that we need to, to make an educated decision on it. That's fine as long as, as, as the resolution would then say that it is not effective immediately. Yes, uh, yes. Okay. Are you writing a resolution? Uh, well, yeah, I can, I can uh, address something with the administration in terms of just a, a amending what we have uh, currently on the uh, committee agenda. 
But I, yeah, I can do that. Well, I, I don't know whoever does it. I, I'm not aware who actually writes the resolution. I, I generally don't, but I, I'll work with uh, Ms. Thomas on uh, uh, on putting uh, some changes to what's on, currently on the uh, committee agenda so that it's clear that it will, if adopted, won't be effective immediately, will not be effective immediately. Yeah, Jeff, I already kind of scratched something out. I'll send it to you tomorrow. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Directors, are you okay with all that? Comments? Yes. I'm okay with that. I have yeah. I have some I have some comments and my comments are this. Just for the audience that's listening, our student athletes, their parents, coaches, whatever, our students need to understand that we do very much care about their educational attainment and what they achieve. However, they need to understand too that having higher expectations of them is only going to just prepare them for life and let them know that <clears throat> you always got to do your best. And if those students are struggling, we also got to let them know too that help is there, but they got to reach yeah. out for help. And that first line of defense is their teacher. Because if that teacher is seeing that that student is really putting forth the effort, I don't know many teachers who aren't going to be willing to stand behind their student when that student is striving to learn and achieve in their classroom. So I just wanted to put that out there and let our students know that we're willing to give them the support, but also they got to make themselves, put themselves in a position to avail the support that's coming their way. We know you're superior and we want to keep you there. We want you to see it yourself. Okay. What's that? Madam, Madam President. Yes. Anything? Go ahead. If if our student can run a ninety nine yard touchdown, I don't think there ain't nothing else they can't do in the classroom. You know that's right. You know that's right. <laughs> you know that's right. I think if we put the bar up for them, I think I know they'll do it. They can do it. But just like what is the wrap, the torso in the hair? If you yeah. want to just be because you can just be lazy and not do it, then you will. But if someone give you a challenge, that tortoise won that race, but they stay steady and strong. <clears throat> okay. Um, do we have any, excuse me, I apologize. Any other discussion on policy one, two, three? I was wrong, Madam President, 99 and a half yards. Thank you, Dr. Fitch. <laughs> <laughs> See that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Kudos. Who ran it? Give him a minute. He'll tell you. Who, who, who ran it so we can praise him? Jaheen White. His <laughs> nickname is Florida. Is he a sophomore? Yes, he is. He's a sophomore. That's what I'm talking about. Good. Okay. Currently doing well in school. I, well, I was going to say, probably well, that's is. That's exciting. Congratulations. All right. Thank Congratulations, you, Dr. Mr. Bench. White. We appreciate you on our football field. Yep. Congratulations. Yes, congratulate. Is there any more discussion on policy one, two, three? Hearing none, is there any discussion on any other two policies? Do we have any other comments? I can't more? see the policies anymore. Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> if I may, President Sweeney, the changes to 247 and 249 are just small changes due to Title IX. It's just changes in language. If they're not um, major changes or paragraphs or anything, it's just a couple of words. So just all Title IX stuff that we have to do. We'll have some more Title IX policies next month as well that we have to update. Thank you. You're welcome. With that being said, anybody have any comments? Superintendent, you have any remarks? No remarks. We're going into executive session after this, aren't we? Uh, oh, I have a question. Are we going into executive session 
<laughs> we are. We are. I don't have a link to yes, it. Yes, you do. Check we your email. We were just sent a link. I was just sent a link? Okay. 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 You know? Yeah. You got to find it. Okay. With that being said, I believe that's all that we have for committee meeting. Do you have a... Did I miss anything? No. Okay. I would like to adjourn the meeting. Do, may I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? <laughs> we don't, we don't, we don't yeah. need a motion to adjourn this committee meeting, right? No. Right. Are you an we don't need a motion to adjourn the committee meeting. I just can just adjourn it. With that being said, meetings 